Ladies and gentlemen, I'm George Thorman. I'd like to welcome you again to a program of local history. Uh, my guest today is George C. Walker, who uh, was head of the YMCA here and who has been a distinguished citizen of St. Thomas since 1949. But he's been a distinguished citizen of Canada for a long time before that. So we're going to do a review of George C. Walker's life today and the many achievements that he has made, uh, serving in the Army, winner of a military medal during the First World War, bicycle racing champion, YMCA director, and a generally a public citizen, and in addition, a man who has made not a fetish but a habit of good health and taking care of his body. He's a perfect example for the doctrine of the YMCA. George, it's very nice of you to come on this program, and I'd like to start right out by uh, telling me where you were born and where you had your early education. Well, George, I was born actually in, Prince, uh, in Brackley, Be Brackley Point, Prince Edward Island, and uh, unfortunately my mother died when I was three years old, and I was adopted by one grandmother and my other two brothers were taken by the other grandmother and I was more or less shifted around during my early life from one home to the other with aunts and uncles. Uh, I finally settled in with a, when dad married again after the South African War with a stepmother. Uh, my two brothers uh, came, to get, uh, came, came with, we joined them but uh, we, we, up to that time, we hadn't been together very much. Uh, when the, one of my brothers graduated from Prince of Wales College, uh, he got, uh, went in the bank and uh, moved out of the province. And my second brother, who was a governor general's medalist uh, on his graduation, uh, he did the same thing as soon as he graduated from Prince Edward Island. Uh, as far as I was concerned, my education was in West Kent School, and I attended there until uh, about 1912. And uh, so after that, I uh, went over to Halifax and t took a couple of military courses each year. Uh, George, let me interrupt you there. Now, uh, 1912. 19, I should have uh, said 1913. Uh, uh, why did you go to Halifax for a military uh, courses? A mili uh, Halifax was a citadel and had the many military courses. And uh, Dad felt, uh, being a South African war veteran, that uh, military training was good for everybody. And uh, I wasn't too happy at home with uh, when my brothers went away. And he felt that would do me good be good for me, and that's how I got in the militia, as it was known at that time. Well, then were I, you with the Prince Edward Island militia, or were you with the, uh, the Nova Scotia militia? I was with the Prince Edward Island militia, uh, an Army Medical Corps, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, war, uh, I jumped into uh, 1914, and I was still with the militia, and when war was declared, uh, I, my dad and I were both uh, with the medical corps en route up to Petawawa for summer training. Uh, well, how we, old was your father at that time? I mean, he'd been in well, the South African. Well, he was a South African war veteran. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to say how old he was because I'm not a, not too sure what, how old he was. But he uh, was very active in the militia. He was a quartermaster major at that time. And uh, war was declared in uh, 1914, and uh, we were diverted from Petawawa en route to, uh, we went to Valcarci Camp. And we arrived in Valcarci Camp. There were two units there ahead of us, uh, an engineers and an Army Service Corps. And we saw Valcarci Camp grow from 300 to to 30,000 uh, incident, incidents in connection with it. I was riding a horse one afternoon, saw some a kilty unit come in and heard my name called, and I looked down, that was one of my brothers, uh, 13th Battalion. So then on, 
Education. Well, then, uh, yeah. what, what unit were you with when you went overseas? Well, then, uh, we had a family uh, a discussion, and uh, Dad being the boss, uh, he decided that he would, was going overseas. My brother was, uh, had already decided that he, he was there, and I was the youngest, so I had to go home and look after some property, which I did. Dad went overseas in 1914, uh, and my brother went overseas in 1914. Dad was with the first Canadian unit to arrive in France. Uh, he has the Mon we have the Mon Star uh, for, that, for that. He was with a, an ambulance unit, and he was there before November 22, 1914. Mm -hmm. The other brother went over in the 13th Battalion a little later. Well, then, uh, <clears throat> so you have to go home and look after the family affairs for a while, but I, then... Uh, Dad had 14 acres of land just outside of Charlottetown. Mm -hmm. And somebody, if you want to grow potatoes, you've got to look after them. <laughs> That's so, right. Uh, <laughs> Any farmer will tell you that. <laughs> uh, I grew potatoes for, the, for a year, and then 1915 came along very soon, and, uh, and I got this telegram from Dad to... Uh, uh, saying that I could enlist. Oh, I see. So I enlisted from then, and uh, I got overseas in 1915, uh, so it went from there. Mm -hmm. Well, when, uh, uh, did uh, you do some training in England first? We trained in a place called Rothy in England, not too far from Brighton, for about three months before we went to France. And what unit were you with in France? I was with the ca Second Canadian Siege Battery. I was a signaler. Signal mm -hmm. And uh, in that uh, Siege Battery, what uh, size guns were they? Say that again? What size uh, weapons? Uh, we have, uh, the gun was called a 5.9 uh, nine howitzer. Oh, yeah. A howitzer is a gun, uh, a gun that throws the... Uh, projectile high in the air and comes down and not a, not a, a direct route. Mm -hmm. And uh, the shells weighed 100 pounds, and uh, as a signaler, I uh, had to be out on lay our telephone lines and keep up communication to uh, see where the shell landed and make any corrections and uh, get them back to our unit. Uh, so many degrees right or left, whichever it happened to yeah. be, or minus and plus. Well, in other words, you had to lay the line from the observation officer who was directing the fire back to the battery. That's a, so that is correct. The orders, yeah. Well, and uh, laying the line isn't that simple. You had no. To, there was no telephone poles. Uh, it was all groundwork, and they had to be follow. Most of them, our work had to follow trenches, and. Uh, then someone would come along and stumble over the wire and break it, and we had tapping in stations. And uh, possibly every 200 yards, we'd have a tapping in station yeah. to keep our line in repair. And we had to carry all the equipment with us uh, and uh, all the wire with us uh, on all those uh, tri trips or. Uh, activities as we went along. Well, then, uh, once your battery started the fire, like the First World War was noted for the counter-battery fire, and uh, the Germans would be firing oh. back, and then your lines would take a chance of well, being hit? Well, uh, that was the biggest hazard, uh, shells landing on the line, and uh, you were in the open, and uh, uh, you just had a duck when you heard them coming. It, uh, yeah. it was shell hole where a lot of it was trench work, and uh, the rest of it was shell hole work. Uh, George, your, your memories of that uh, period, I know you weren't in the trenches the same way that the infantry were, but uh, the conditions must have been appalling, eh? Well, it wasn't a broad walk, I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, incident, uh, the trenches, we had little duck walks in the trenches. The trenches were at minimum of six foot uh, deep, and they were just a little more than shoulder width. Uh, we had duck walks that the Army Service Corps had to make uh, in the bottom of them to, uh, so we wouldn't get drowned in the mud. And uh, Now, is this true that uh, in, in that area was fought over for years, really, 
and there were just the, the whole ground was pitted with holes, and you had rain and mud. There was no natural drainage anymore, and people did ground in those shell holes. Didn't they? Uh, the, the, well, go along a little farther. Uh, many men were reported missing. When they were reported missing, and one of my brothers was reported missing, uh, which may come to later, uh, his body was never uh, never recovered. He was just buried in the mud. Yeah. Uh, in uh, some of the pictures you may show, it shows a gun stuck in the mud. Uh, that had to be manhandled. There's no way of getting uh, uh, tractors or four-wheel drive machines up to pull it out. It was in there and had to become, uh, be brought out by uh, men on a rope. Well, uh, was, this, uh, was your artillery horse drawn? When it was moving up to the front, was it drawn by horses? Uh, it, uh, no, or we, we could go up a certain distance with four-wheel drives on the highway as far as we could get. No. And then from there on, we got into our, pl our battery position, and uh, it is manhandled in. No. I think uh, we'll, we'll try and show a couple of these pictures. That if I had... Uh, been a little more attentive and gone to see George last night, we could have made a better choice here, I think. But these are uh, a couple pictures here. I'll let the camera focus in on them. Uh, the top one shows them manhandling the gun. I don't think you can perhaps see that too much. A bunch of men on a rope. Uh, the bottom picture is an interesting one because uh, it was originally black and white and then it had been tinted and this shows the hundred pound shell <coughs> pile at their gun position and then I want to show two more from this album uh, this picture uh, shows Vimy Ridge in the distance and uh, really, it's just a desolate-looking moon landscape is what it looks like. That uh, area was shelled innumerable times by the Germans and by the British. It was fought over, and, and uh, it's just a quagmire. And then one more to give you an idea of the time. This is a picture near Ypres. And the uh, soldiers are marching down the road, and that is Ypres in the background. And, of course, you can see how it has been shelled in the war. Uh, I was in Ypres for a couple years ago, and, uh, of course, it's all rebuilt. You can't see any of that anymore. But it was totally destroyed in the war by German shell fire and by Allied shell fire. Well, George, <coughs> um, your big... Uh, you, you had a distinguished war career, and uh, you um, uh, were a <coughs> awarded a military medal. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what action was that in? North of Lens. Uh, read uh, I'll, uh, I'll just read this. Uh, uh, this is the uh, citation. On August the 16th, 1917, during an attack north of Lens, he assisted in laying telephone lines in the open in advance of front line and as linesmen kept up communication throughout the day to the next tapping in station under continuous heavy shell, machine gun, and sniper fire. He was gassed on the night of the 14th during preparations for the attack but carried on in spite of great exhaustion until relieved on the 16th. That is the citation that was in the London Gazette on the um, 12th of December, 1917. And uh, the Military Medal, this is George's list of uh, medals here, if we can uh, focus in on this uh, picture. Uh, the Military Medal, because it's for valor and is uh, always worn the first one, and then the other are the Service Medals of the yes, uh, uh, service First medals World Queen War. Ju Queen Jubilee and her long service. Yeah. And uh, then his discharge certificate says that he enlisted at Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, on the 16th of September, 1915. And he served in the 2nd Siege Battalion in France. And uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it says he has scars on his right upper arm and his right leg, and he was wounded twice, and uh, the dates of that are there, and at the time this was done, uh, his date of discharge, he was discharged on the 6th of June, 1919, at Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. George, uh, the Battle of Vimy is uh, regarded as the, the really the greatest Canadian victory of the First World War. Correct. Do you want to tell us something about your experiences? That well, day? Vimy was the French had tried to take Vimy four different attacks, and the story is there's fifteen thousand dead Frenchmen there. Yep. They lost each time. Vimy was a hill overlooking. Uh, I'm not just uh, uh, one of the valleys, uh, the name is lost, and uh, it was supposed to be impregnable. The Germans had six machine gun uh, pillboxes, we called them, up on the top of it. They had, each pillbox was manned by two machine gunners, uh, and they were chained to their machine gun. I actually saw two dead Germans still, ta still chained to their machine guns uh, when we captured Vimy. Uh, how, we, how Vimy came to be uh, captured by the Canadians, there was a terrific amount of tunnel work done. Uh, I think it was six tunnels and uh, about half a mile, or no, it would be less than half a mile, 600 yards apart. And uh, they were quite lengthy. I'm not sure of their length at the present time. But the night before, all the troops went up as far as they could in those tunnels and were massed there for the attack. At 5 o'clock in the morning, the uh, front of the tunnels were blown out and everybody had to go out through the, through the hole. Uh, when the, we got in the open, we were in line with, the, with German pillboxes. And we had the uh, whole valley in front of us. Uh, the infantry went ahead and they captured the Germans asleep in their uh, dugouts and our artillery caught the Germans totally unprepared for an attack. And uh, therein lies the story of Vimy Ridge. Well, I, I think uh, maybe to make it a little a bit clearer for the people here, Vimy Ridge is a long ridge of land, and whoever had possession of it could dominate the land on either side of it. And the Germans had held it for years, and in effect, the whole Canadian Army, they all took part, didn't they? Yes. They had to charge up that slope to reach the top of the hill and then hold it against German counterattacks. And it really was a, a, a tremendous victory for the, uh, the Canadian troops. Now, <clears throat> your job is uh, the signaler. Uh, in, in the Army, it's not like ringing a phone now. You have to have somebody who carries a portable phone and a reel of cable and unreels it and establishes communication with the people who are at the front of the attacking group and back to the uh, brigade commanders and the uh, colonels and the artillery and so on. Now, how did you spend that day, George? Well, number one, we try to keep up uh, our telephone line. Uh, there's four methods of signaling, roughly. There's telephone, uh, of passing, communicating is a better word. Uh, with our battery, uh, one was telephone, uh, another was uh, flag wagging, as we called it, the semaphore, one, two, yeah. three, four, uh, the, which we had the alphabet for. Another was flag wagging, where you have one flag. And then we, we also had a, a Lucas lamp, which was just a shutter. You keep yeah. the lamp going up and down and uh, flashing. And uh, we had a, a sundial. Uh, name is gone. Uh, a, a sun arrangement. Uh, oh, for heli heliograph. 
heliograph. Yeah. That's the right word. And uh, which I, we had to use the one that was functional. Yeah. And uh, w in order to use the uh, anything but the telephone, you had to be in the open. Yeah. Uh, we, we had a group of boys that I was associated with that uh, we were good uh, you know, as far as our job was concerned, and uh, we kept up communication. We had to have an officer, which we called the observing officer, uh, the observation post officer, who, uh, who gave us the orders, and we had to tra transmit them back, yeah, yeah. Uh, make the gun, gun corrections. Yeah. And I, I, I <coughs> might say that uh, uh, signaling, <laughs> In an attack in wartime, the, the signalers are really of paramount importance for getting information back uh, of where the resistance is, of where the strong points that the Germans are holding are, and uh, uh, in order for the attacking commander to reallocate his troops and so on. Uh, I, I, uh, I was in the war myself in the Second World War, and I always admired the signalers a great deal. <laughs> You're sitting in your sort of office in an old barnyard, and you say to the guy, I can't get communication with brigade, and he has to go out and trace that uh, telephone line and find out where it's been ripped. Well, George, where were you wounded? What uh, places? I was wounded on Vimy. You, yeah. And I got a piece of shrapnel on my right shoulder, and uh, I stayed out in the, uh, on it, and uh, I got a Quite a good uh, supply of gas at the same time. But, uh, you were safer staying where you were than you were tra uh, going back. And uh, yeah. besides, I was mobile, so I, there's no advantage in going going back. Uh, that was one of my wounds, and the other was on the Somme when I got uh, a piece of shrapnel on my on my right leg, which. Uh, Still, still bothers me still bothers. Uh, quite a lot. Quite a lot. Uh, the, Can you uh, forecast the weather from your leg wound? I'm sorry. Does it, does your leg ache when it's going to rain, or the? Uh, it uh, it aches most of most of the time. If I when I I feel it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, George, it was your uh, the war eventually. What was your outstanding impression of the war? Of the well, what sticks in your mind? The outstanding thing was uh, the Canadians were a dedicated uh, group of people. There were exceptions. You got exceptions in every line of activity, but uh, we were, the Canadians were known as a, an outstanding unit, and Vimy was a, an impregnable fortress, and uh, that's one of the reasons they were chosen to take it, and uh, uh, it, it was taken. Uh, the val it was Liévon, which was uh, that uh, was the uh, uh, big uh, munition center behind Vimy Ridge. It's, uh, they were uh, Germans protected. Uh, we had a job to do, and we did it. Uh, yeah. I, I I think the uh, the Canadians came out of the First World War with the reputation, and this is not from our side, but from German sources of being the finest assault troops in the First World War. Well, uh, war was a novelty to all of us, and uh, some had a little background. As I had my father's South African War, but uh, we had the uh, a very excellent class of persons. Some of the units were a McGill College unit. Yeah. Uh, uh, we had a battery, the Eighth Siege, I think, was practically all McGill College people. We had. Uh, a high-class caliber of person. Uh, my two brothers were bankers. So, uh, then we had another group of, uh, we had a tug-of-war team that, in our unit, and the, most of the men were fishermen and farmers. And when they got on tug-of-war rope, uh, they won a championship out of, out of uh, one, of our, one of our athletic meets be back of the line. Well, it was the caliber of person we had in it. There's no question of, uh, I can't do that. No. Well, George, uh, were you ever appalled that the, uh, uh, the First World War, Kansas, suffered a tremendous number of casualties?
were a small nation. We were a very small population. Then I think we had 65,000 killed. <laughs> yeah, and that's not including all those who were wounded. 65,000 killed. So I suppose in a place like St. Thomas or any other town in Canada, uh, every family would have lost somebody. Well, we're particularly in a place like Prince Edward Island. Uh, we had, I think, there's eight different units that mobilized in the uh, troops from the Prince Edward Island area. Mm -hmm. And a matter of information, uh, my son Mac came back, came home from uh, collegiate one day and asked how it was there's so many single women uh, living in, uh, in Prince Edward Island. I explained to him that so many men were killed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was just no men, there wasn't enough men to go around. Yeah. Uh, well, then, you came back to Canada, but then you have a shoulder that's in very bad shape. Now, tell us what you did about rehabilitating yourself. Well, that's possibly where I got into YMCA. Yes, it is. I came back, and uh, actually, I, at Dad's request, after the second, well, I can go back a piece. Uh, my second brother came overseas. Uh, in 1915, and neither Dad or I knew he was coming until we got word that he, he was killed. Oh. But uh, Dad and uh, one brother went in 14, my brother Austin and I went in 15, and both brothers were killed in 1916. In 1917, I was twice wounded and decorated for bravery, and then Dad, uh, who was in the casualty clearing station at that time, uh, asked that uh, our lieutenant colonel, if I'd uh, be shipped out of the country, he did want to take one son home, and I yeah, was the only yeah. one left. Yeah. So uh, they sent me over to England as an officer training course, and from there I uh, uh, got halfway through it when armistice was uh, declared in 1918, and uh, I was sent back to Canada for demobilization. Well, I. Uh, uh, they found that I had uh, lo uh, no sight in one of my eyes uh, and that my wounds were still open. Uh, so they sent me to Camp Hill Hospital, and I was there for th about three months. Where is that? Hos where Camp is that? Hill Hospital was in Halifax, Halifax. which is our Halifax. nearest mm -hmm. hospital center. Well, while there, they took the piece of shrapnel out of the back of my right shoulder. Uh, I didn't, uh, when I was hospitalized, I didn't... Uh, I'd, I was I, a casualty booked for England, but I talked them out of it because my dad and my brothers were in France, and I didn't, I didn't want to go uh, to lose touch with them, so they let me get back with the shrapnel in my shoulder. But they t took it out in Camp Hill. I had it for a long time, about half inch in diameter, and the leg wound was still running. In, uh, yeah, well, that's the reason they sent me to Halifax, and uh, they put me on a, a leg brace from my hip and crotch down, and uh, I wasn't allowed to uh, move without that iron brace uh, down both sides of my leg, uh, fastened to the body. And from there, uh, I had to get, I had very little use of my right hand after they cut the uh, back, shoulder. And uh, when I got my discharge in July, June, June 1916, 19, 19, June 16, 19. 19, 19, 19 um, they told me that I had to keep off that leg as much as I could for as, for as, mu as long as I could. So I got into bike racing from there, but uh, the wounds always hurt, and uh, the arm. I had very little strength in it, so I went to the YMCA every day, and they had what they called in those days traveling rings. And I used to go from one ring to the other uh, for a half hour at a time, uh, holding on to those rings and swing from one to the other, and gradually that brought my arm back. Other things I did, I, uh, with an arm wound, you got to use it, I'd swing a bucket of water and swing a bucket of sand. I did those, those things in Camp Hill Hospital under uh, what the rehabilitation and um, 
Then I got into Indian club swinging as one of the activities that uh, would help, and I kept on going. I still swing Indian clubs. I uh, have a couple of sets in the back of my car, and when I'm traveling, I swing Indian clubs. But it's one of the things that uh, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have the use of my hands as I have now. Yeah. It's beginning, it affects me a little bit. I have the grip in the fingers. The only thing I won't do with my right hand is I won't drink a cup of tea with my right hand. I always use the left for that because the feeling is qu not quite there. But that is rehabilitation. And one time they ran short of somebody that to look after the physical activities in the Y. And I had been playing around there with... Uh, uh, most of the time, in my spare time, just to, because I, w I needed the exercise, uh, the rings was what I was doing most, and from there they asked me if I'd uh, go on as their physical director. And I started the Y in 1921 in Charlottetown, and I enjoyed it very, very much. Well then, uh, <coughs> I think it's in uh, interesting that uh, you had a leg wound and an arm wound that if you hadn't concentrated on them yourself would have been a permanent disability. No one, well, sometime in your life you get a kick in the teeth and uh, uh, you got to make up your mind, uh, where am I going? And I enjoyed uh, being a hospital uh, patient for a while. Everybody was very, very good to me. And uh, uh, all the, but uh, Somebody, some, some way, uh, I began to think that you can't live this way. We got $60 a month for six months, and uh, that at that time was a fair amount of money, but uh, uh, it ran out. So we had to make a living, and uh, that started me looking after my body. I was really on crutches for some time after I got out, uh, and then I worked at a, sec a job as on the section gang on the railway for a year. And uh, that uh, didn't entail a great deal of walking. And for transportation, I was using a bicycle pretty near exclusively. And uh, from there, I, I kept on rehabilitating myself. Yeah, well, now, George, you used the Indian club swinging to uh, fix your arm up. And I guess that's a marvelous exercise, isn't it, for exercising a great well, number of muscles? At least I think so. I yeah. still do it. And, yeah. uh, uh, I have torches on the, on a set of them, and I dip them in wood alcohol and dis, do displays yeah. with them. But now for your leg, to bring back your leg with that bad shrapnel wound, you took up bicycle riding, and you became very good at bicycle riding. I found it very enjoyable and uh, good transport, uh, cheapest transportation. Uh, bicycle racing, racing on Prince Edward Island was quite a an important activity, and the, yeah. some of the older men that weren't overseas were the champions, and I got in with them, and I kept on going, and yeah. uh, we won have more have than a, my share of races. We have a picture here of, uh, uh, these are all the trophies that uh, George won uh, prior to uh, uh, 1923. And uh, you, you must have become a very, uh, a very accomplished uh, bicycle rider. Uh, that's quite a quite an award uh, of medals, and uh, there he is as a young man. You uh, look a little better than George than you do now. That w was taken after what they called the Windsor to Halifax bicycle race, which was 45 miles, and uh, I won that the first year I was in it, and uh, that is how I come to get that picture. Well, uh, George, you were a good enough bike rider that you uh, nearly qualified for the Olympics. Well, that came along in 1924. And uh, we came, we were, Elliot McGuigan was a friend of mine. He's a, uh, he uh, felt that he was exceptionally good. He won four firsts in the Maritime uh, Athletic Championships. And uh, we were both chosen to go over. And I went in to see Elliot one, uh, one morning and he said, George, I'm not going over. I said, why? I'm going to be a Jesuit priest. He was a nephew, by the way, of Cardinal, Cardinal McGuigan. Oh, yeah. And uh, 
matters would have something to do with his decision. Well, I had, in the meantime, I got into YMCA, and I was working there, and I, uh, I said uh, I had some a little balancing to do. Uh, do I give this up and start all over again and go over? And I did realize that European bike ra racers were superior to us uh, in their equipment and their ability because they trained uh, much, much more extensively than we did. So I said, Elliot, if you're not going, I'm not going either. So that's that threw it over. That was your Olympic. This is one other picture of uh, uh, George with all those trophies won before 1923, plus uh, other ones that uh, have been uh, achieved then. And uh, that's really quite an impressive array of, of trophies. And while we're doing that, I think we may as well skip to 1975. And uh, this is the <coughs> Prince Edward Island Sports Hall of Fame, and uh, George Clark Walker was inducted into that on the 20th of July, 1975. George, I think it's safe to say that <clears throat> what you, uh, the course you adopted to improve your leg and your arm uh, led you really to this lifelong association with uh, physical fitness and working for the YMCA. Well, it is true. If I didn't do it, no one else was going to do it for me. I also got severely gassed and... Uh, I do my share of wheezing now, but I keep on doing things. But if you don't, do not use the arm, it's not, no one else is going to use it. No, You've got to no. do it. Yeah. Well then, uh, George, uh, you started out in the YMCA in Prince Edward Island, and then you went out west. No, uh, actually, I, was, I spent f approximately five years in Charlottetown, uh, very enjoyable, the why there. And then I got a move, asked me if I'd go up to Sherbrooke, Quebec, and I spent uh, uh, close to five years in Sherbrooke, Quebec. Uh, then I, an opportunity came to go west. And, uh, my wife had been in Western Canada, and uh, uh, she taught at Regina College for some time, and she had relatives out there, so we went out to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. I had 20 years in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, including the Depression. Well, <laughs> you know, that's a funny thing, George, but uh, I was brought up in Brandon, and uh, I remember going to a basketball game in Brandon at the YMCA between the Moose Jaw team and the uh, Brandon team, and you were the referee of that game. Well, I did. I carried an official uh, uh, refereeing card from the uh, from Quebec out to Saskatchewan, yeah. and uh, I did quite a bit of re basketball refereeing out in the Western Canada. Now, uh, tell me in the Depression in the West, I'm familiar with that period, what was your salary as the director of the <laughs> YMCA in Moose Jaw in the 1930s? I went to Western Canada on a salary of 1800 a year. Uh, there a month in 19, I went there in 29, early 30, they come in and ask me, George, we, ha we can't raise any money, uh, will you stay with us for 1500 a year? I did. Yeah. And uh, I was there for 20 years. I, I, I enjoyed the Depression. Everybody, there, no, one had any, no one had any excessive amount of money. Uh, we did a great deal of work for the uh, people that were in trouble. About 60% of Moose Jaw was on relief, as we called yeah, it out yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, I had a class a twice a week of 100. I had to put a limit on, on it, uh, free in the YMCA, and uh, I'd give them PT and uh, uh, a shower and a swim, and they had to be supervised. Uh, during all uh, during all the depression, <coughs> the YMCA ran its own financial campaign, uh, which I was uh, responsible for mostly, and we never failed to reach our objective. There are incidents that are interesting. Uh, I remember 
One told her, uh, we had a banquet each night when her intensive campaign was on, and uh, uh, the uh, owner and of the Times uh, Times newspaper came in about five o'clock. How are we, George? Well, I said, Tom, we're short. It was Tom, Thomas Miller was his name. He later became governor, uh, governor of Saskatchewan. And I said, we're short about $500. Well, give me the phone, George. And uh, called long distance, called up uh, uh, Jim Richardson in uh, Winnipeg. He said, oh, he's at, uh, he's at supper, cannot be disturbed. Uh, that was the answer he got. Tell him Tom Miller called, he was on the phone. He came, what do you want, Jim? What do you want, Tom? Uh, he said, we're short $500 in Moose Jaw for the yeah. family. Check will be in the mail in the morning. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Uh, other incidents in collecting money. We were walking down the street one day, a fellow by the name of Fred Jones and I, and this fellow coming down, he, he owned 22 sections of land at that time. He said, Let us, let's hit him up for $1,000, George. I said, no, let him hit for seven fifty. So we stopped this fellow, talked to him for a minute. How about giving us $1,000 to the YMCA? I will not. I'll only give you 750 So we walked away with a check of 750 He wrote it up against the brick wall. But, uh, the YMCA at that time was uh, a part of the community, and uh, uh, they couldn't do without it. My no, wife was uh, uh, working, had a large class of uh, uh, repair work. Uh, people come, come bring their work in, and uh, she would supervise her repairing. In the YMCA, I think we had seven educa educational classes for the unemployed, and the uh, every morning. So things like that were going, and that was the reason that we reached our objective. I, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I think the, well, the Y here in St. Thomas uh, had a sort of similar history, too. I think the Y's all over, but the Depression was much more severe in the West than it was here. They thought uh, it was a little bad. Oh, so. it was just terrible. Just well, then, George, let's, we, we've got 15 minutes left, and we've got to get you to St. Thomas. Eh? We've still got you marooned out there in Moose Jaw. Uh, when did you come to St. Thomas? I came to St. Thomas in 1949. Uh -huh. Now, why did you come here? Uh, uh, well, I had two boys growing up. And unless you uh, had a business or a farm, uh, you'd lose them. Uh, my wife and I were both born in Prince Edward Island. <coughs> it was a long drive down to Prince Edward Island from Saskatchewan. So uh, I was looking for an opening down here, and uh, somebody uh, got, knew of it down here, and I got a call one day asking me if I'd come to St. Thomas. Oh, yeah. that, that is it. Yeah. Now, I, uh, the interesting thing, when you came to St. Thomas, the YMCA had been here for a long, long time, and it had always been supported very well by the public. Uh, several times it was on the point of closing, and uh, they, they got enough money to keep going. Uh, the, tell me, uh, there's an interesting story about the insurance. When you came here in 1949, what was that YMCA insured for? The building was insured, the whole unit was insured for $50,000. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I, I suppose that just, they hadn't looked at it for years and years and years. Uh, and well, it didn't make much difference whether you looked at it, they didn't have any money. <laughs> no, to pay more insurance. But what did you, what was your first thing you did here? Well, uh, with the help of some of our senior citizens, uh, the uh, senior businessmen of the community, they felt the insurance should be at a minimum of 200000 yeah. and was raised to that amount. Well then, uh, which was very fortunate because in 1953 we had uh, one of St. Thomas's biggest fires uh, when the YMCA burned, and uh, that was a case of arson, was it? That, that, that was, it was quite, uh, uh, quite
quite difficult to, to ascertain the cause of the fire, and I brought in the insurance investigator, and he called me in the second day, and he said, so-and-so set that fire, George, keep your mouth shut. And there was a, we'd lost two lives in that fire, and there's an inquest, and I was on the stand for an hour and a quarter. And the lawyers weren't very kind to me. I had to answer an awful, a uh, fair number of questions in a very evasive way, because I didn't want to uh, uh, say what I knew. But there was no, uh, we knew it was arson, we knew who lit it, and uh, we knew where he was. He's finally caught in uh, Calgary, lighting another fire in a, in a hospital out there. No. I don't know where he is now, but that, uh, the insurance... Well, he was brought back here for trial, wasn't he? Uh, I'm sorry? Was he not uh, brought back here for trial? No. No, he wasn't. There's no advantage. He was, he was uh, jailed uh, out there. Yeah. And, well, that was very fortunate that you'd raised the insurance to $200,000. But even at that, you must have had a difficult time getting the Y well, rebuilt. Well, uh, at that time, we felt that the building was, uh, could be rebuilt. We had four solid walls, and it was gutted pretty well inside, quite well. And with the aid of architect Fred Green and some and the board, they felt it should be rebuilt uh, completely. So we brought in from our YMCA building bureau in New York, we brought, uh, finance, uh, building, finance committee in New York, uh, we brought in a, an expert fundraiser. I won't quote figures, I've just forgotten what they were, but we raised uh, close to, we had a debt of about 50,000 after that uh, building was completed, uh, which we had to clear off. And it was reopened, completely renovated uh, in 1955, yeah. uh, two years to the date of the fire. And then uh, the new debt you had, uh, you had that building free of debt by what year? Uh, we had to work on it, and uh, we kept on working at it. And 1961, at my retirement, the building was entirely free of debt. Yeah. Now, um, uh, George, uh, I know your wife has played a very big part in your life, and uh, they say behind every successful man there's a, there's a very strong woman, and uh, I, I think it's very true in your case. When did you get married? We got married in 1929. 1929. Uh, we sort of, uh, I was asked when I was being discharged if I would ev ev evade or avoid getting married for 10 years because of a nervous condition. Uh, my physical condition uh, wasn't conducive to married life. Yeah. Many uh, vets of the First World War married immediately after. They had uh, children that uh, weren't mentally right, deformities and that type of thing. And that is what the doctors had in mind. Yeah. Uh, there's two re another reason I uh, didn't have enough money to support <laughs> no, a wife no. on, yeah. <coughs> and my wife and I weren't sure about a lot of things. Uh, she went out to Regina and taught in Regina College, and she taught phys ed, by the way, and elocution. And uh, I went to Moose Jaw. We said goodbye on on the train. We were away from each other for a year, and uh, we came back to uh, uh, together for the Christmas and the, for the summer holiday, and we decided to get married in 29. Uh, I knew the superintendent of education very well in St. Thomas, uh, I beg your pardon, in uh, Sherbrooke, Quebec. and. Uh, I also knew a, a cousin of my wife that was teaching at Sandshead College, and she was teaching expression. And she had a son in Regina that uh, uh, she wanted to see, so I talked with her a, a little bit, and she was very willing to go out to Regina and take my wife's jo job, and I was very willing to have a, my girlfriend come back to uh, Sherbrooke, Quebec, and. Uh, 
Uh, we, we arranged to get married. <laughs> uh, one other picture I think we should show. This is uh, George uh, Walker's family and uh, his two sons, Bud and Mac, and their wives and the grandchildren, all skiing in 1973. <clears throat> and you've always uh, kept uh, an interest in, uh, in physical fitness. Uh, why did you retire here, George? You've moved around so much, you must have liked St. Thomas. Well, I had, uh, I had that in mind coming through somewhere in the East. And uh, I felt Ontario, whether you like, or like it or not, of the Westerners and the Easterners, I, had, I knew their opinions of both of them, of what they thought of Ontario. But <laughs> Ontario is still the center of Canada. Yes. And the uh, uh, source of uh, good, uh, good country to live in. Yeah. And it does have, despite the kind of weather we're having right now, it does have a little shorter winter than you have out west. Eh? Uh, well, no, you haven't seen a, a winter. Uh, you haven't seen a winter yet. <laughs> no, no, not unless you've had one out we're west. Wife yeah. and I were just talking about the sands. Yeah. We have, we have seen sandstorms out west as severe as you've had any snowstorms yeah. here yeah. to date this year. Yes, that was uh, in the drifting in the 1930s out there. Would, uh, we used to say in Manitoba the sky would just be black, and we'd say there's Saskatchewan blowing down this way again, you know. Well, they tell the story about the farmer pulling a track of some equipment down the highway, and they asked him where he's going. He said, I'm just following my farm down the road. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to uh, um, uh, visualize that um, uh, for people who've never seen it. Uh, you, when you have a dust storm and it just blows and piles up and drifts the same way that snow does here when we have a bit of it a blizzard. It just took the whole topsoil right off the land and they, we had a weed called the Russian thistle, some of you have heard of, and uh, when that thistle came up against the wire fence, it uh, would be stopped, the sand would, you could walk over the wire fence. Yes, yeah, I've seen that very often. That, that Russian thistle was one of the few uh, uh, one of the few things that would grow in those terribly dry years, it always seemed to have a crop of Russian thistle. Well, then after the uh, Depression and after the uh, uh, drought, or the lack of rain out there, uh, they made strip farming, and they'd have a, a bear strip and then yeah, a farm yeah, strip. Yeah. And, uh, that is how they brought the, way, the yes. West back. Yes. They, they've done a, a good job on that. Well, George, um, I want to say something about your physical activities right now. Um, at age 86, and you'll soon be 87, uh, just tell me some of the uh, exercising you do during a typical week. Well, to start with, I get up in the morning, I go down to the basement and have a shower. <laughs> And I feel, I know, as far as I'm concerned, a shower to me loosens up all my yeah. tight muscles and is beneficial for me. Without that, I'm stepping for the, re for the day. I keep active. I kept active when I was in the Y, but since I retired, I have got into other activities. I got into cross-country skiing. I would like to do ground hill, downhill, but I have one son that uh, is an expert, and he said, I won't, I won't give any downhill skis, so I do, uh, I, uh, do all the downhill I can do with my cross-country skis out at the golf club, yeah. and I've been out quite a lot this year. I swing clubs uh, every now and then when I travel. I skate about twice a week uh, in both arenas. I uh, drive my bicycle. I, what, what else? Have you not you talked about swimming? Oh, yes. I swim once or twice a week out of the high Y pool, and uh, I do, involved in that, I do some diving. I have six different strokes that I swim one length of each, and I have six different dives that I do one or two of each during the day, and that takes an hour, and it's a good healthy hour. And many seniors of the city could avail themselves of that, 
for a dollar you can't lose, and it's a very excellent pool, and uh, it does warrant a larger, much larger usage of that facility. Yeah. Now this is the pool in the new building. The pool out in the new building. Yeah. Uh, George, uh, we have a couple minutes left, and uh, it's, it's really been very interesting to talk to you and review your career and the Army and your self-rehabilitation. And uh, I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to say more about Mac and Bud, your two boys who've all done very well. And uh, I, I think it'd be interesting for older people who are watching that they should do exercising. You've always believed that. I've always believed that if you if you don't uh, you just you no one can do it for you if you don't feel like no. if you haven't got the initiative in yourself to go and do it no, no use going to the doctor no. uh, unless you've got an illness but a pure l l non usage of a, an extremity yeah. of uh, your whole body uh, tends to make it useless. To yeah, do much yeah. with. Okay, now we just have uh, half a, uh, a minute to go. I think I'm going to have to wipe it up. George, thank you very much for uh, coming out and doing this program, and I'd uh, like to thank the people who are watching, and I hope you enjoyed this show as much as I've enjoyed talking to George C. Washington. Thank you very much.